Women, often seen as nurturers and caregivers, have, at times, shocked the world with their involvement in chilling crimes. But before we jump into the stories that sent shivers down society's spine, we're taking a detour into the aftermath, the moment when these women, once agents of darkness, face the weight of a life sentence. Join us as we dive into female serial killers reacting to life sentences, where things get seriously sinister. Myra Hindley. In the annals of true crime, few names evoke as much terror and revulsion as Myra Hindley. It all began in the summer of 1963, when Hindley, then 21 years old, met Ian Brady, a troubled individual with a dark and sinister mind. Little did anyone know that this seemingly ordinary couple would go on to commit a series of heinous acts that would haunt the nation for decades to come. Their first victim was Pauline Reed, a 16-year-old girl who crossed paths with Hindley and Brady on July 12, 1963. Hindley lured Pauline into their car, under the guise of helping her find a lost Lost glove on Saddleworth Moor. Unbeknownst to Pauline, this would be the last time she would ever be seen alive. The couple took her to a remote location on the moor, where Brady brutally assaulted and strangled her. Her body would not be discovered until 1987, buried deep within the desolate landscape. The following year, on November 23, 1964, Hindley and Brady struck again. This time, their victim was John Kilbride, a 12-year-old boy who had the misfortune of crossing paths with the sadistic duo. The year 1965 marked a turning point in the couple's reign of terror. On June 16th, they abducted 12-year-old Keith Bennett, a boy who would become their youngest victim. Keith's fate was sealed when Hindley lured him into their car, offering him a ride to a nearby fair. The fourth victim, Leslie Ann Downey, suffered a fate even more horrifying than the others. On December 26th, 1964, Hindley and Brady spotted Leslie, a 10-year-old girl, at a fairground. They approached her, pretending to be a lost couple in need of assistance. Trusting and innocent, Leslie agreed to accompany them. Brady and Hindley took Leslie to their home, where she was subjected to to unimaginable torture and abuse. The final victim attributed to Hindley and Brady's reign of terror was Edward Evans, a 17-year-old boy who met a gruesome fate on October 6, 1965. The pair was finally apprehended following the murder of Edward Evans. Using an axe, they took the life of the young boy while Myra's brother-in-law was present in the room. The brother-in-law subsequently reported the incident to the police, ultimately unveiling their string of murders. This event unfolded on October 1, 2022. The trial for Myra Hindley began on April 27, 1966, at Chester Assizes, with Mr. Justice Fenton Atkinson presiding over the case. As the trial progressed, the jury was confronted with the harrowing details of the murders. Hindley's defense team focused on portraying Hindley as a vulnerable and manipulated individual under the influence of Brady. However, the prosecution countered these claims with evidence that suggested Hindley was an active participant, luring victims and assisting in their disposal. The trial took a dramatic turn when Hindley took the stand in her own defense. In a calculated move, she sought to distance herself from the crimes, claiming that she had been under Brady's control and had acted out of fear for her own life. However, her testimony was met with skepticism as the prosecution relentlessly cross-examined her, highlighting inconsistencies and challenging her version of events. After a grueling 14-day trial, the jury retired to deliberate on the charges against Hindley. After two hours and 14 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned with their verdict. Myra Hindley was convicted in May 1966 and received a mandatory life sentence in accordance with the murder, abolition of Death Penalty Act, 1965. She was sentenced to two life terms, and an additional seven years were imposed on her as an accessory in the Kilbride murder. Joanna Dennehy. Dennehy's reign of terror began in 2013, when she embarked on a killing spree that left three innocent men dead. With a complete disregard for human life, she showed no mercy as she brutally stabbed her victims multiple times. The first victim of Dennehy's wrath was Lukasz Slabajewski, a Polish national who had made a life for himself in the UK. Dennehy lured him to her home under false pretenses, promising him a night of companionship. Little did Lukasz know that he was walking into a nightmare. Dennehy's true intentions were far from innocent. Once inside her home, she unleashed her fury upon him, stabbing him repeatedly with a knife. Lukash's lifeless body was callously disposed of in a wheelie bin, as if he were nothing more than rubbish. Dennehy's thirst for blood was far from quenched. Her next victim was John Chapman, a Falklands War veteran, who had faced the horrors of battle only to meet his end at the hands of a cold-blooded killer. Dennehy used the same method of deception, luring John to her home before launching a vicious attack. The knife sliced through the air, finding its mark again and again. John's life was extinguished, and his body was discarded in a wheelie bin, just like Lukash before him. The randomness of Dennehy's crimes sent shockwaves through the communities she terrorized. No one was safe from her wrath. The fear of being the next victim gripped the nation, as people wondered who would be targeted next. The police launched a nationwide manhunt to capture Dennehy and bring her to justice. The public was on high alert, 
with everyone keeping a watchful eye for any sign of her whereabouts. Finally, on that fateful day in April 2013, Dennehy's reign of terror came to an end. The police apprehended her in Herefordshire, where she was found hiding in a house. The trial of Joanna Dennehy was a highly publicized event, with media outlets from around the country closely following every twist and turn. The evidence against Dennehy was overwhelming. The forensic experts meticulously pieced together the puzzle, presenting a compelling narrative of her crimes. The knife used in the attacks was found stained with the blood of her victims. DNA evidence linked Dennehy to the scenes of the murders, leaving no doubt about her guilt. But it wasn't just the physical evidence that painted a damning picture of Dennehy. Witnesses took the stand, recounting the chilling details of her actions. They described her lack of remorse and her cold and calculated demeanor. It was clear that Dennehy had no regard for human life, viewing her victims as mere objects to satisfy her twisted desires. Throughout the trial, Dennehy showed no remorse. She sat in the dock, seemingly unaffected by the gravity of her actions. The defense attempted to paint a picture of Dennehy as a victim herself, claiming that she suffered from a personality disorder that impaired her judgment. But the prosecution countered with a powerful argument, highlighting the calculated nature of her crimes. They argued that Dennehy was fully aware of her actions and should be held accountable for them. In February 2014, the jury delivered their verdict. Joanna Dennehy was found guilty on all counts. Dennehy was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order, meaning she would never be eligible for parole. Even after her sentencing, Dennehy continued to shock the world with her lack of remorse. In a chilling letter written from her prison cell, she stated that an apology would be pointless. Her callous disregard for the lives she had taken only further solidified her reputation as a cold-blooded killer. Lucy Letby, born 4th of January 1990, is a British serial killer and former neonatal nurse convicted of the murder of seven infants and the attempted murder of six others. Letby's crimes spanned a period of 13 months, from June 2015 to July 2016, at the neonatal unit of the hospital. Letby's preferred methods of harm included injecting the infants with insulin or air, as well as force-feeding them milk. These actions resulted in the deaths of five baby boys and two baby girls. The vulnerability of these innocent lives made them easy targets for Letby's malevolence. The victims, just days or weeks old, were unable to defend themselves against Letby's calculated actions. As Lucy's trial unfolded, the courtroom was filled with a palpable sense of grief and anger. The testimonies of medical experts revealed the extent of Letby's actions. They explained how the injections of insulin or air caused fatal complications in the infant's fragile bodies. The force-feeding of milk, intended to nourish and sustain, became a weapon in Letby's hands. Throughout the trial, Letby maintained her innocence, denying all the charges brought against her. Her stoic demeanor in the face of overwhelming evidence left many in disbelief. Letby's defense attorney argued that there was no direct evidence linking her to the crime. They claimed that the prosecution's case was built on circumstantial evidence and that Letby had been unfairly targeted. However, the weight of the evidence against her was undeniable. After a long and harrowing trial, the jury reached their verdict. Lucy Letby was found guilty of murdering the seven infants and attempting to murder six others. Judge James Goss, presiding over the case, delivered a scathing statement during the sentencing. He described Letby's actions as displaying malevolence bordering on sadism. Recognizing the severity of her crimes, Judge Goss imposed a rare whole-life order, ensuring that Letby would spend the rest of her life behind bars with no chance of release. Letby's reaction to the sentencing was one of defiance. She refused to appear in court, denying the grieving parents the opportunity to confront her. Face to face, her refusal to acknowledge the pain she had caused only added to the anguish felt by the families affected by her actions. Despite her conviction, Letby has recently applied for leave to appeal against her sentence. The Court of Appeal will consider her application, but no date for the appeal has been set. Dorothea Puente. Dorothea Puente, the infamous death house landlady, had a troubled upbringing that laid the foundation for the darkness that would consume her later years. Born on January 9, 1929 in Redlands, California, Puente's early life was marred by the influence of alcoholic parents and a history of abuse. Her father, Jesse James Gray, was an alcoholic who struggled with his own demons. He often found solace in the bottle, leaving young Dorothea to witness the destructive power of addiction firsthand. Her mother, Trudy May Gray, also battled alcoholism, creating a chaotic and unstable environment for Puente and her siblings. As if the presence of alcoholism wasn't enough, Puente also endured a history of abuse. She was subjected to physical and emotional mistreatment, further deepening the scars that would shape her future actions. Puente's troubled upbringing set the stage for a tumultuous adulthood. She entered into multiple marriages, seeking stability and companionship, but often finding disappointment and heartache instead. Throughout her life, Puente had numerous run-ins with the law, displaying a pattern of deceit and manipulation. She was charged with various crimes, including forgery, theft, 
theft, and even drugging individuals to steal their pensions. It was during her time in Sacramento, California in the 1980s that Puente's true nature would be revealed. She turned her focus to running a boarding house, presenting herself as a caregiver and a pillar of the community. However, behind closed doors, she preyed upon vulnerable individuals, targeting the elderly and mentally disabled. Puente's boarding house became a house of horrors, where she lured unsuspecting victims with promises of care and support. Once under her roof, they became trapped in a web of manipulation and cruelty. Puente would read their mail, confiscate their money and social security checks, and exploit their vulnerabilities for her own gain. The depths of Puente's depravity were truly shocking. She would murder her boarders, disposing of their bodies in the yard of her boarding house. The motive behind her crimes was simple, yet sinister. She cashed in their social security checks, profiting from their deaths. The exact number of victims remains uncertain, but Puente was convicted of three murders and suspected of many more. In 1988, Puente's reign of terror came to an end when the police made a gruesome discovery. Bodies buried in the yard of her boarding house were unearthed, revealing the horrifying extent of her crimes. The trial of Dorothea Puente began in 1990, marking the start of a legal battle that would last for several years. Puente entered a not guilty plea and faced nine murder counts, reflecting the suspected number of victims associated with her crimes. The jury selection process concluded in January 1993, with a panel of individuals tasked with determining Puente's fate. On February 9, 1993, the trial officially opened opened, drawing widespread media attention and public interest. Throughout the trial, the jury was confronted with the harrowing testimonies of witnesses, survivors, and experts who shed light on the extent of Puente's crimes. The prosecution meticulously presented the evidence, linking Puente to the murders and exposing the depths of her deceit. The defense, on the other hand, sought to cast doubt on the prosecution's case, challenging the credibility of witnesses and attempting to create alternative narratives. As the trial progressed, the jury became deadlocked in August 1993, unable to reach a unanimous decision on all nine murder counts. However, despite the impasse, Puente was eventually found guilty of three of the murders. The sentencing phase of the trial commenced, and the prosecution sought the harshest punishment for Puente's heinous acts. The court, recognizing the severity of her crimes, sentenced Puente to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Puente's conviction was reaffirmed in 1997, as the legal system upheld the jury's decision and recognized the overwhelming evidence against her. The jurors, who had played a crucial role in delivering justice, were cleared by a judge in 1998, ensuring that their integrity and dedication to the case were acknowledged. Throughout the trial, Puente maintained her innocence, vehemently denying any involvement in the murders. She continued to insist that the deaths of her boarders were the result of natural causes, despite the mountain of evidence stacked against her. Her refusal to accept responsibility for her actions only added to the chilling nature of her crimes. Rose West. From 1973 to 1987, Rose West, alongside her partner in crime, Fred, unleashed a reign of terror that left the nation in a state of disbelief. Born in 1953 into a poor family, Rose's early years were marred by a series of traumatic events that would shape her future in unimaginable ways. Growing up, Rose's mother battled with depression, a condition that was exacerbated during and after her pregnancy. To treat her depression, Rose's mother underwent electroconvulsive therapy, a controversial procedure that was believed to alleviate symptoms but often left lasting emotional scars. Tragically, Rose was not spared from the horrors that plagued her family. She became a victim of sexual abuse at the hands of her own father. As Rose entered adolescence, she sought solace outside the confines of her troubled home. At the age of 15, she met Fred West, and in 1972, Rose and Fred West tied the knot, sealing their twisted bond. They moved to Cromwell Street in Gloucester, where their house would become the setting for unspeakable acts of violence and horror. To support their lifestyle, Rose turned to prostitution, engaging in casual sex with lodgers and others. But it wasn't just Rose's external actions that revealed her sinister nature. Within the confines of her own home, she subjected her own children to unspeakable horrors. The West's children were not only victims of sexual abuse, but also endured severe physical and emotional torment. The couple's criminal activities extended beyond their family. The following years saw a string of victims, including Caroline Owens, Linda Guff, Lucy Partington, Juanita Mott, Therese Siegenthaler, Alison Chambers, Shirley Robinson, and 15-year-old schoolgirls Carol Ann Cooper and Shirley Hubbard all fell prey to brutal attacks, followed by murder, dismemberment, and burial in the cellar. Rose continued to have more children, and the household maintained strict control over them, even as Fred's perverse interests extended to his own daughters. In 19 
1994, the reign of terror orchestrated by Rose and Fred West came crashing down when they engaged a nanny, 17-year-old Caroline Owens. In late 1972, Owens faced abduction, assault, and threats of burial in the cellar, but managed to escape leading to charges against the Wests. In August 1992, Fred West was arrested for the rape of his own 13-year-old daughter, a shocking revelation that sent shockwaves through the nation. Rose West, too, faced charges of child cruelty. In June 1993, the case against the Wests collapsed when their daughter, the victim of Fred's abuse, refused to testify. However, the disappearance of their daughter Heather in 1987 would prove to be the catalyst for a renewed investigation. With no closure and mounting suspicions, the authorities were determined to uncover the fate of the missing girl. In February 1994, their efforts would yield a shocking breakthrough. Human remains and signs of torture were discovered at 25 Cromwell Street, the West's residence in Gloucester. The remains of multiple victims were unearthed, each discovery more horrifying than the last. The Wests had not only taken lives, but had subjected their victims to unimaginable torture before their eventual demise. As the evidence mounted, the focus shifted to Rose West, who adamantly denied any involvement in the murders. She claimed that her husband Fred had acted alone, painting herself as an innocent bystander caught up in his web of darkness. But the mounting evidence told a different story. Fred West, burdened by guilt and facing the consequences of his actions, confided in his appropriate adult, revealing the truth about Rose's involvement in the murders. He disclosed that she had not only assisted in the dismemberment of victims, but had also played an active role in the murder of their own daughter, Heather, in 1987. The trial, which began in October 1995, was a harrowing spectacle that captivated the public's attention. Rose pleaded not guilty to the charges, maintaining her innocence and pointing the finger solely at her deceased husband. However, the prosecution presented a mountain of evidence that painted a damning picture of Rose's sadistic behavior and direct involvement in the murders. After a grueling trial, that lasted 31 days, the verdict was reached. Rose West was found guilty on all counts, including the murder of Charmaine, her stepdaughter, and nine other young women. The weight of her crimes finally caught up with her as the judge delivered the life sentence that she would spend behind bars. Rose's reaction to the verdict was chillingly devoid of emotion. She displayed no remorse for the lives she had taken or the pain she had inflicted upon countless others. Beverly Allett in the quiet town of Grantham, England, a sinister presence lurked within the walls of the local hospital. Beverly Allett, a seemingly caring and compassionate nurse, would soon reveal her true nature as the angel of death. It all began on a fateful day in 1991, when seven-month-old Liam Taylor was admitted to the children's ward with a chest infection. Allett, with her soothing words and reassuring demeanor, convinced Liam's parents that he was in capable hands. She urged them to go home and get some rest, promising to watch over their precious baby. Little did they know, this would be the last time they would see their son alive. As the night wore on, Liam experienced a respiratory crisis. Alit was left alone with the young boy, and his condition rapidly deteriorated. His once rosy complexion turned deathly pale, and red blotches appeared on his face. Alit frantically summoned the emergency resuscitation team, but it was too late. Liam suffered severe brain damage and was kept alive only by life support machines. His devastated parents were forced to make the agonizing decision to remove him from life support, and Liam's cause of death was recorded as heart failure. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, Liam's tragic death was just the beginning of Alit's reign of terror. In the weeks that followed, Alit continued her malevolent spree, targeting vulnerable patients like 11-year-old Timothy Hardwick and 1-year-old Kaylee Desmond. Tragedy struck repeatedly under Alit's care. Five-month-old Paul Crampton, suffering from a bronchial infection, survived multiple near comas due to fluctuating insulin levels. His transfer to another hospital revealed an excess of insulin. The horror extended to five-year-old Bradley Gibson, a pneumonia sufferer and two-year-old Yik Hung Chan, falsely diagnosed with a fractured skull. Twins Katie and Becky Phillips, aged two months, faced Alit's sinister intentions. Becky's mysterious death and Katie's survival after lung collapse unraveled the dark truth. The shocking truth behind Alit's crimes began to unravel when an inquiry was initiated by Dr. Nelson Porter, a consultant at the hospital. He was alarmed by the unusually high number of cardiac arrests in the children's ward over the previous two months. The police were called in and Superintendent Stuart Clifton took charge of the investigation. Record checks revealed missing nursing logs that corresponded to the time period when Paul Crampton had been in the ward. As the pieces of the puzzle came together, it became clear that Alit was present at every suspicious episode. The missing logs, the high doses of insulin, and the reports of missing. Keys to the insulin refrigerator all pointed to her guilt. In November 1991, Alit was formally charged with murder. During her interrogation, she maintained her innocence, claiming she had only been caring for the victims. However, 
the evidence against her was overwhelming. A search of her home uncovered parts of the missing nursing log, further incriminating her. In February 1993, Allett's trial began at Nottingham Crown Court. Prosecutors meticulously presented the evidence linking her to each suspicious episode. The jury heard about the high levels of insulin and potassium found in the victim's blood, as well as the injection and puncture marks. The pediatrics expert, Professor Roy Meadow, explained Munchausen's syndrome and Munchausen's by proxy syndrome, shedding light on Allett's behavior and psychological state. After a trial that lasted nearly two months, Allett was convicted on May 23, 1993. She received 13 life sentences for murder and attempted murder. The judge emphasized that the severity of her crimes warranted the harshest punishment, considering the immense suffering inflicted upon the victims, their families, and the damage done to the nursing profession. Janine Jones Janine Jones began her career as a nurse in the pediatric ICU of a San Antonio hospital. Little did anyone suspect the horrors that would unfold under her care. Jones had access to vulnerable infants who were already in critical condition, making them easy targets for her sinister intentions. Early on, there were whispers and suspicions among her colleagues. Nurses on the night shift, which they ominously referred to as the death shift, noticed an unusually high number of deaths occurring when Jones was on duty. But it wasn't until years later that these suspicions would be validated. In the 1980s, Jones was finally convicted of murdering 15-month-old Chelsea McClellan using a paralyzing muscle relaxant. This conviction shed light on the possibility that Jones may have been responsible for the deaths of many more innocent babies. The shocking revelations surrounding Jones's crimes sent shockwaves through the medical community and the public at large. The question on everyone's mind was how someone entrusted with the care of the most vulnerable could commit such heinous acts. Despite being convicted of only one murder in 1984, Janine Jones was set to be released from prison in 2018 due to a mandatory release law. However, determined family members of her victims were not willing to let her walk free. They fought tirelessly to keep her behind bars and seek justice for their lost loved ones. Their efforts paid off when, in 2017, Jones was indicted for the murders of five children. The new murder charges brought a glimmer of hope for the families who had long believed that Jones was responsible for more than just one death. Jones, however, pleaded not guilty, setting the stage for a high-stakes trial. As the trial approached, prosecutors gathered extensive evidence against Jones. The state's witness list contained an astonishing 267 names, and a laundry list of extraneous offenses included claims that Jones had murdered 24 children. The weight of the evidence against her was overwhelming. In an attempt to avoid a lengthy and highly publicized trial, a plea deal was proposed. Jones would plead guilty to injury to a child with intent to cause serious bodily injury in all five cases, resulting in a 50-year sentence. This deal would likely keep her in prison for the rest of her life. The families of the victims faced a difficult decision. While they wanted justice for their children, they also wanted to avoid the pain and trauma of a trial. Ultimately, they agreed to the plea deal, knowing that it would ensure Jones would never walk free again. The trial of Janine Jones was a highly anticipated event, as the families of her victims anxiously awaited the opportunity to see justice served. Prosecutors presented a mountain of evidence, including testimonies from medical professionals, families, and fellow inmates. The sheer number of victims and the methodical nature of Jones's crimes left a lasting impact on everyone involved. Jones, facing the weight of the evidence against her, made the decision to plead guilty to murdering one child, Josh Sawyer, with a deadly weapon. The other charges were dismissed as part of the plea deal. Each family was given the opportunity to deliver a victim impact statement in court, expressing their relief, anger, and grief. The impact statements were emotional and powerful, as parents shared the devastating loss they experienced and the lasting trauma caused by Jones's actions. After the trial, the death certificates for the five children were amended to reflect their deaths as homicides or undetermined causes. This official recognition of their deaths as a result of Jones's actions brought a sense of closure to the families, validating their belief that justice had been served. While the sentencing brought some measure of closure, the families of the victims will forever carry the pain and trauma caused by Jones's crimes. Juana Barraza Born in the 1970s, Barraza's early life was marred by hardship and abandonment. At the tender age of 12, Barraza's life took a devastating turn when her alcoholic mother made the heart-wrenching decision to give her away. She was handed over to a man who would subject her to unimaginable abuse. As Barraza grew older, she found solace in the world of wrestling. With dreams of becoming a professional masked wrestler, she adopted the persona of La Dama del Silencio, the Lady of Silence. In the ring, she could temporarily escape the pain of her past and channel her anger into a controlled outlet. However, the wrestling world was not enough to quell the darkness that consumed her. It is believed that Barraza's crimes were driven by a deep-seated hatred for elderly women, a rage that stemmed from her own traumatic experiences. 
Profilers and psychologists suggest that she saw these vulnerable individuals as symbols of her own mother, the woman who had abandoned her. By targeting elderly women, Baraza sought to release the pent-up anger and resentment she harbored towards her mother. The methods Baraza employed to carry out her crimes were as chilling as they were calculated. She would prowl public places, seeking out elderly women who were alone and vulnerable. Through acts of kindness, such as helping with their shopping bags or offering cleaning work, she would gain their trust and access to their homes. On other occasions, she would pose as a nurse or social worker using the guise of providing free checkups or information about benefits to gain entry. Once inside her victims' homes, Baraza would unleash her violent tendencies. Armed with everyday objects such as phone cables, tights, or the stethoscope she often carried with her, she would strangle her unsuspecting victims. The brutality of her crimes was shocking, leaving a community in fear and disbelief. The Matavidita's epithet, meaning little old lady killer, was coined in 2005 when a series of elderly women were found strangled in their homes. The police found fingerprints and released an artist's impression, but the focus was on a potential transvestite murderer, leading them to overlook Baraza's seemingly innocent appearance. With her neatly cut short hair and conservative street clothes, she managed to evade suspicion until the unexpected arrival of a lodger at the scene of one of her crimes triggered her arrest. After the shocking revelation of Juana Baraza as the Mataviejitas, the community demanded justice for the lives she had mercilessly taken. The legal proceedings that followed her arrest were filled with tension as the nation awaited the fate of this remorseless killer. In a moment that sent shockwaves through the courtroom, Baraza was found guilty on all counts. The weight of her crimes was reflected in the sentence handed down, an astonishing 759 years in jail. The announcement of Baraza's life sentence was met with a mix of relief and disbelief. The community, still reeling from the horrors she had inflicted, found solace in the fact that she would never walk free again. The families of her victims, though forever scarred by their loss, could finally find some semblance of closure, knowing that just Justice had been served. Baradza, however, showed little emotion as she heard the verdict. Her defiance remained intact as she addressed the court, saying, May God forgive you and not forget me. She announced her intention to appeal against all but one of the convictions, further prolonging the agony for the families of her victims. This was all about female serial killers reacting to life sentences. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.